Kalina Stork. We are glad that you're here. Tonight's presentation is given, for, uh, given uh, in conjunction with the Cleveland Heights Landmark Commission, the Cleveland Heights Historical Society, and Heights Library. We all, all welcome you there. We have two more programs coming up in that um, sponsorship series. The next one is Immigrants and Migrants. Our speaker is John Borowski. If you've never heard him speak, you should just come to hear him because he's fabulous. Um, a very well-respected local historian. And that will be on October 2nd. And then following that, we have a program on the Shakers in Cleveland Heights. A significant portion of the Shaker community was actually located in Cleveland Heights, so we'll learn about that. And both of them are illustrated lectures. Tonight, we will be learning about recently historic, the homes of the 1950s and 60s. Our speaker is Mary from the Cleveland Restoration Society. Um, she has been with the Society for since 2011, and she specializes in their Heritage Home Program. Heritage Home Loan Program. Heritage mm -hmm. Home Program, <laughs> which there are brochures here. Um, I've actually gone through the program on a previous house. It is fabulous. If you're looking to do work on your older Cleveland Heights home, they um, not only provide low interest loans, but also a lot of preservation based technical assistance. So it is, in fact, a wonderful program. Um, and in addition to that, Mary gives wonderful programs about <laughs> history and old buildings and all the good stuff. So we, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. And yes. On the Shakers in Cleveland Heights, what day is that? I'm sorry, it's on October 30th. 30th? Yeah. Okay. Go Thanks, Maisie. Yep. Hi, good evening. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, I'm trying to get acclimated to the video cameras in the back room, so excuse my nerves. <laughs> um, I try to speak loud. I get very animated. Um, so, if, But if you cannot hear me at any point, just let me know and I will turn on the PA system. Uh, tonight we will be learning about recently historic homes of the 1950s and 60s. At the start, I'll try to put them into context. We'll kind of talk about um, the evolution of housing types and how we got to our mid-century modern housing styles. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about that uh, context. Where are we? How did we get to um, having our mid-century housing? To start, we need to talk about pre-war and post-war. When we say pre-war, we're talking about pre-World War II, um, and, and which started in 1939. Um, prior to that, the United States was in the grips of the Great Depression. And I think we all have an understanding of the state of America during the Great Depression. But to give you an idea of the effect of the Depression and World War II, on housing in the United States, let's take a look at the numbers of the housing starts. In 1925, there were nearly one million housing, housing units created. By 1933, the number dropped to only 93,000 units. It's a, quite a significant drop. But then World War II started, and that also stunted the housing growth and housing construction due to wartime shortages of materials and men and families and the need. So at the end of World War II in 1945, the U.S. began to enter a period of relative stability. The American people were eager to put the Depression and the war behind them. At the same time, 13 million veterans were returning home, creating a boon of de demand for the American dream, namely a home of one's own. So this money tree may be a little bit of an exaggeration, <laughs> but compared to the previous decade, Economic times were, in fact, improving. Post-war brought a, a relative, robust economy. There was a high level of savings, adding that to the pent-up demand and the fact that peacetime salaries were higher than pre-war, we created this robust economy. Housing was also made possible by a couple federal incentives. We had the GI Bill of Rights in 1944, which provided numerous benefits for returning um, veterans. The National Housing Act of 1949 um, also provide additional financing incentives, um, a sum associated with the Urban Renewal Project. Um, the FHA offered their 30-year 0% down loan 
Um, I don't know if any of you caught the Plain Dealer this morning, but I felt like all over. It was, where were we five years ago in our housing crisis? And I don't think we'll ever see the 30-year 0% down loan again. Um, people were desiring smaller homes. High inflation nearly doubled the cost of pre-war, or excuse me, doubled the pre-war cost of building a home, resulting in smaller homes being affordable and being built. We also have to think about the inexpensive suburban land that was now an opportunity. The federal work programs and federal highway system opened up suburban areas to development. Land was cheap there, cheaper than in the cities and created this new opportunity for developments. And our beloved automobile. People could get around, they didn't need to solely rely on public transportation in dense urban neighborhoods so they could feel okay moving out to the suburb and commuting back in. So all of these elements, how did this change what the, the post-war homeowner wanted? They wanted a home of their own. They wanted the home to be smaller because it was inexpensive. They wanted something traditional. They wanted to pare down their, their living spaces, make them a little more formal and functional. They wanted a yard. They wanted the modern conveniences. A garage, of course, for the new family car, and something away from the city. <laughs> so, hold on, I'm gonna try this out. I've never done this before. <laughs> I don't know if it's gonna work. So this was the birth of the typical suburban housing that we think of when we think of the 1950s and 1960s. And if anybody's a fan of weeds, I totally ripped that song off <laughs> with this photo. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about the genesis of Genesis of style. How did we get to the suburbs in the houses we know as mid-century? And what are the results? Um, and I, I, I'm going to skim through these very quickly, and I'm going to highlight the major architectural motifs. There's a lot that can go into this, and we can stay here for hours, but I don't think anybody really wants to do that. <laughs> so let's start with the prairie style, uh, most brought to light by Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, the influence of the post-war ranch stems from this, and you can kind of see that through the horizontal lines, the cantilevered roofs, and the large windows that try to bring the outside into the home. The craftsman and bungalow influence, I came to the floor plan. Um, this house, housing style was a lot smaller than, say, a Victorian, and it redefined the living space from having a main parlor, and then a sitting room, and then a dining room, and then a smoking room. It kind of brought all the rooms to a central location. So you walked into the home, you walked into the living room, you walked into where the people were instead of being called and beckoned upon. The simplified floor plans also was a testament to the change of times. People were moving away from having assisted help, so they didn't need all that space. Um, the modernistic period. There's several things to address in this period, the Bauhaus School, Walter Gropius, Mies van der Rohe, uh, the emergence of Art Deco and international styles. The influential concepts and elements include the pared down construction, lack of ornamentation, ribbon windows, expansive windows, and the truth in construction. This style had a small period of popularity and most often in high style but nonetheless an influence on much of the 1900s even today. And I think I, it's beneficial to mention the Homes of Tomorrow um, exhibition that was held at the 1933 Chicago World's Fair, which showcased man's modern inventions in architecture, design, building materials, and transportation. Two, show, two homes showcased there had Cleveland roots, the Brick House and the Armco Farrell Mayflower House. Marcel Brewer and his binucular house. Um, 
illustrates the concept that there should be separate spaces for living and for quiet. And we kind of see this methodology and this philosophy of homes really emerge into the split level and ranch style homes. California's Eichler Houses. Between 1950 and 1974, Joseph Eichler's company, Eichler Homes, built over 11,000 homes in Northern California and Southern California. They all came to be known as Eichlers or in Eichler. Eichler Homes are a form of modernist architecture that has come to be known as the California Modern and typically features the high glass walls, post and beam construction, and open floor plans. A lot of this style really is indebted to Frank Lloyd Wright and Mies van der Rohe. One of Eichler's signature concepts was to bring the outside in, achieved by skylights, floor to ceiling, glass windows with glass transoms, looking out on a protected and private outdoor room, patio, or atrium. Also of note that most Eichler homes feature few, if any, front-facing windows, that is, on the street side. Um, and if there are any, they're small or cantilevered windows like this, how we have here. <laughs> um, and that is to, that's the start of removing uh, from the community, bringing people into the home and into the privacy, having the back outdoor patio and the, for barbecues. So from these influences emerged the major motifs of influential uh, post-war housing. Open floor plan, organic shapes, clean lines, a gentle nod to the past in some instances, as we'll see. Uh, some trendsetters came about, and those were highlighted in the Ladies Home Journal. Um, and then, of course, we have the Sears and Robux, Robux catalog that had the prefab houses. Aside from Sears and Roebuck, there were some other several prefab companies that picked up on these motifs and trends. William Levitt was a U U.S. Navy SEAL, and Alfred Levitt was an architectural draftsman. Together with their vision for housing construction, they created what led to be the mass production of housing on a grand scale. Levittown is considered to be the first mass-produced suburb. Remarkably, the company built 17,450 houses on Long Island between 1947 and 1951. They had the assembly line approach to on-site construction. They used a combination of traditional styling and modern conservation techniques, or construction techniques, excuse me. And their mass production system included pre-cut lumber, pre-cut pipes, copper coils, um, for the radiant heating, he, heated concrete slabs. By 1950, Levitt's crews were erecting a house every 16 minutes. <laughs> the earliest Levittown capes had four rooms and one bath, modern siding like Amazonite or cement asbestos boards with shingles were dominant, dormers, corner windows, and picture windows, which were typically steel casements, were the only architectural embellishment on those in many post-war capes. Later, Levitt houses held lar were larger, had carports, and were closer to the ranch in form. More locally known is the manufacturer Lustron Corporation, um, out, based out of Columbus, Ohio. The engineer was Carl Strandlund. The concept behind these prefab homes were the factory-built porcelain enamel steel panels, both on the interior and the exterior. They were erected on a prepared concrete slab in three and a half days. Approximately only 2,500 were constructed. I think there's two in Cleveland Heights, if anybody wants to correct me if I'm wrong. True, one true one, one put together. <laughs> yes, there, there, in the past two years, there was a gentleman who um, purchased two Lustron homes and then built them together. So it's technically, yeah, kind of not, not technically a restaurant home, but the same materials. <laughs> um, the one is on Euclid Heights Boulevard, and the other one is on, is it on Grandview? Yes. That's, yes, you're, yes. Thanks, Ken. <laughs> um, 
The other type of Gunnison home um, to mention is, or the other type of prefab home is the Gunnison home. Um, and they incorporated assembly line methods that were developed in the automotive industry. They operated from 1936 to 1953. Um, they manufactured housing and then they became U.S. steel homes. The major component of Gunnison homes was construction using stressed wood panels or 4 by 8s or plywood that we think of today. So let's take a minute to view an abbreviated timeline of housing styles. We didn't review all of these just now, but I think this will help illustrate the genesis of the style and, how, and help us identify where elements come from. So 1900 to 1920, you have your bungalow, Foursquare, Prairie, Art Deco. Crossing that period, 1920 to 1940-ish, um, you have your eclectic revivals, colonial revivals, French eclectic, Georgian revivals, Tudor revivals. And about 1935 to 1965 is the time period that we start to see the transition to new build, building styles. And of course, we're still seeing these building styles built today all across the board. <laughs> so the first modern home style is the minimal traditional, which spans from 1935 to 1950. This is kind of a compromise of style. Smaller floor plans, smaller footprints, with traditional revival elements, but with a lot less detail than what we had seen in the past. They were built in immense numbers in the years uh, directly preceding and following World War II. They can often or most be identified by dominant front gables and massive chimneys, low or intermediate pitched roofs with eaves and rake being close, and they can be built of brick, wood, stone, or a combination. The ranch style from 1935 to 1975 is really based on 19th century Western houses, um, 20th century Western houses, that should say, <laughs> influenced by um, the Wright and Prairie School of Thought, perhaps the ultimate symbol of the post-war American dream. When, I, when you think of mid-century, this is what you think of. Um, asymmetrical one-story forms with low-pitched roofs, picture windows, bands of windows, combination of siding materials, shallow porches, and garage doors with accent details. So <laughs> you may have noticed in the past two slides the emergence of the prominent garage, and that's obviously to hold the car. Um, but this also had a different change than just accommodating the vehicle. This really took away the front porch, and you had a small entryway, and that opened up the, the ability to have the big backyard and the back porch and the back patio. Um, the Cape Cod, 1946 to 1956, even though this is not the symbol of architecture, I think the Cape Cod really does show the direct reflection of the post-war objectives, small in size and functional. Eden kitchen, a large living room, had optional furnishings if you wanted them, like a finished attic or even a basement. The split level um, can be defined from 1955 to 1975. Generally, they had two wings, um, three levels, but no true basement. Most commonly made out of brick and wood framing but we also find asbestos cement shingles, plywood, wood shingles, or even clapboards. And uh, windows in the one-story living room portion typically include a large picture window, um, and it's often bowed. The sashes may be one over one, or two over two, or six over six. The roof has a low pitch and plays into that low horizontal lines in the overhanging eaves that we've seen in the prairie. Um, and the double front doors are also common on later examples. Ideally, split levels try to take advantage of uneven or sloping lots. A contemporary style is identified by a flat or low pitched gabled roof shape. The roof sub, excuse me, the Flat roof subtype was influenced by the international style of the 1920s. Uh, they let, this house lacks ornamental detailing, and white stucco wall surfaces in the earlier examples are kind of replaced by the combinations of brick or wood 
in stone. So you can kind of see that this transition here, if you remember from the international style, you saw the stucco side, and now we're incorporating those newer materials. Um, the contemporary gabled portion, I think this is also a common mid-century thought. Um, I think somebody said that they were in the Forest Hills neighborhood, so you may recognize some of these houses. Um, again, influenced by the craftsmen and prairie styles. The features include overhanging eaves, often with exposed roof beams. Heavy piers um, supported the gables as well. Both subtypes are generally one story, though we often find two stories as well. So mid-century modern, if we've learned anything yet, um, hopefully that you'll take away mid-century means low horizontal planes um, and design emphasis with minimal details. Floor plans being open, casual, and with mixed use. And the goal was to try to blend the indoors and outdoors seamlessly. But let's take a look at some other distinctive design features as well. So even though we had these large open floor plans, some people did want to try to partition off the rooms. Um, and those came in various materials, whether it's a knee wall um, with some kind of indoor planting, or corrugated glass, metalwork with geometric design, and even the modern fold doors were used to separate the spaces. Let's not forget about our modern conveniences. I was work talking with a, an older construction fellow, and he remembers building in the suburbs. And the option was, do you want to have your house insulated, or do you want an oven? And he said 90% of the time, everybody took the oven. So now we have all these homes that have no insulation. <laughs> Um, again, those, those modern uh, appliances um, went into the open kitchens. Um, cabinets were made of enameled panels or steel or wood cabinets. Uh, Mid-century furnishing, furnishings. There's an increased emphasis on ergonomic comfort in well-designed, lower-cost furniture. Mid-century lighting, I always feel like, looks like things from Space Age Wonders. <laughs> Wall coverings in either coveted or despicable patterns. <laughs> Mid-century flooring, um, about 1951 is where we saw the emergence of the LVT, or the luxury vinyl floor tile which I don't know if any, how many of you have done a renovation of an older home, but had to scrape up that LVT off the floor. <laughs> uh, Mid-century carpeting. About 1950, it was, about, it was like somebody had opened up a trunk, a magic trunk, and out of that trunk came man-made fibers, new spinning techniques, new dye equipment, uh, new printing processes, uh, and new tufting equipment to, to make all these different varieties of carpeting. And so now is when we see the wool broadloom, wall-to-wall -wall, wall -wall carpeting really become popular. Mid-century window treatments were also very important. Um, this is a photograph from the Pittsburgh Plate Glass Company, and you'll see that it has a very large expanse window. And especially in our climate, a very large expanse window needs a very large, thick curtain. <laughs> um, so. Synthetic fabrics really came into play here with rayon and viscose employed for easy care. And even though the patent for the traverse curtain rod was in 1928 by the Kirsch Company, it really came in handy to cover that long expanse and move those curtains with ease. So we do, ooh, okay. <laughs> we do have some preservation challenges. Uh, Mid-century modern homes were cutting edge, are cutting edge. Um, but these cutting edge techniques didn't mean long-term stability. New mass-produced components stopped being produced, or uh, they were upgraded, or they were replaced, or they were not able to get them to replace in kind. Standards of living have changed to what we think is, mod is acceptable to our modern homeowners. 
and energy efficiency was not necessarily a focus back then. And I think the biggest efficiency matter that we deal with mid-century homes are the windows because they are expansive. Um, and a lot of them are metal casements, and metal casements aren't easy to find, and they're kind of expensive to replace in kind. So what do we do about that? Do we try to replace them with a aluminum-clad wood window in dark nature so they kind of look like metal casements? Um, think about that, and let's chat. And some of the materials that were used back then, um, they may no longer be available. They may be cost prohibitive, or they may have fallen out of favor. And we also have to acknowledge that some of these materials are just not durable, and it's not worth replacing in kind, or they're not even sustainable. So let's kind of transition into planning, repair, and improvement projects. None of my photos necessarily attribute to mid-century modern, but when you're thinking about repairing and improving your home, I think these rules go across the board, no matter what si style, size, home you have. So you first have to look at what are the important character-defining features. Identify those. And does what architectural style is it? Do those features fit that architectural style, or have they been an add-on in later years? It's important to look at the massing. Is, it hot? is the roof pitched? tall? Is it roof pitch low? Is it symmetrical? Is it asymmetrical? Are projections a part of the style? How does it sit on the surrounding land? And then again, the materials themselves. What is the home made out of? What is the material? Should we repair this? Should we replace it? Is it original? Is it even, is it even appropriate for the home? So here's some kind of best practice guidelines. Accept your house for what it is and not for what you want it be, to be. Just because you have this vision of you know, a cute little bungalow in your home, but your home doesn't necessarily lend itself to that, you can't add an addition or add a dormer to make it something that it's not. Um, <laughs> and improvements don't always make it better, <laughs> despite how much you want an enclosed porch or you really want those vinyl windows. <laughs> And the wrong repair or the wrong repair person can do more harm than good. That's why it's really important to identify what are the materials you're working with, what is the best material to complement that or to make those repairs. And when you are applying architectural details, make sure that they're appropriate for the style of the house. And then choose the best style, choose the best size, more importantly, um, and even down to the color. And scale should always be considered, no matter what you're doing. <laughs> so post-war residences tell a unique story of important housing trends, both in the distinctive architectural styles and forms that developed, and in the new size and design of subdivisions to meet the explosive housing, explosive housing demands. Today, there is a renewed interest in modern architecture in homes of the recent past, Mid-century housing remains accessible and affordable, but it also needs to be seen as valuable. So with that, I'd like to thank you for coming. Um, if you have any questions about your particular home, don't forget to call the Heritage Home Program. We'd be happy to set up a site visit with you and have our preservation construction manager come out, talk with you about your materials of the home and how you can go about repairing them. Now I'd like to open it up for questions and or conversation. Sure. If I can figure this out. You're welcome. Yes, I have two hands. <laughs> Some of those uh, factory homes that you mentioned, mm -hmm. are there ways to identify them? Um, I mean, like, is there a, is there a name plate or? or anything, or do you just have to be able to recognize what it is? Um, sometimes a little bit of both, and um, hopefully there's a building permit on file, because um, I get a lot of people like, I think I have a Sears kit home, and it's not really until you get into the inside, if you're willing to demolish a wall and look at the lumber and look for the, the symbols, you know, then have at it, but a lot of the times, a lot of the information is hidden if it's not readily available 
um, you know, if you're not buying the house from the person who built it, or if you can't find the building card. We have a registry in Cleveland Heights of suspected mail order houses. Okay. Houses. Okay. And that's where we do the registry. Who's in charge of that? Uh, Wayne Martin. Okay. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, what is the earliest and latest Sears homes? That's a good question. Thanks, Ken. <laughs> Yes, Mark. I'm curious about the, uh, the garage doors. Um, yeah, I can try and go back. You know, I see I see a lot of those um, four stills and you know various places. I'm not going to try. Sorry. Four still, I should say. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering if those tended to be um, factory designed, uh, factory designs mm -hmm. in all cases, in most cases, or you know, how often were aftermarket. Designs apply to um, put on, yeah. So, was there personal, how much personalization went into these? I don't remember what that was. I think it's a, a little bit of both. I think a lot of them were factory produced. Um, you know, here's your template, pick your pick the design and style that you like. Um, we see a lot of the V's, um, and that's kind of intentional. Think about the Cadillac symbol, think about the Chevrolet symbol um, coming out of World War II. The victory symbol, um, it, it kind of all lends itself together. I, I can speak with the Forest Hill Garage. I live in Forest Hill, and I've been there 19 years, and there are uh, some sensational garage doors in that area. I mean, these are custom garage doors with, with beautiful architectural embellishments. They were always wooden. Mm -hmm. Some of them were, were uh, vertical paneled, uh, and unfortunately, we have lost them. Tremendous amount of those garage doors. Are set. I, for whatever reason, our residents you know, they don't they don't maintain it, and they simply they, they, they get rid of them with the you know the standard steel or you know, vinyl garage door. It's, it's really sad. And I think we need to address that as a community to try to save some of these nice garage doors. Mm -hmm. Yes, Bill. It's interesting to go back to the county archives, the fees. Yes, uh, Bill. Yes, Bill. To see what the garage doors look yep. like. Yes. Then. Uh, or something today. Yeah. So if you don't, if you're not familiar with with what Bill was talking about, um, from about 1948 to 1965, very rough years, Cuyahoga County did a survey of every single residential or really every building in Cuyahoga County and took a photo of it. Um, they're held on file at the county archives. Um, sometimes we're lucky and we're able to pull the appraisal card and see the photo. Sometimes they got lost in the shuffle. But I think that's a great idea. What year did they take the photos? And maybe 48 is a little early. Maybe it's more like 53. 53 to 64, 65. <laughs> the county did, it was part of their tax appraisal, reappraisal process, and that's what they did back then. They went and they took, they had two men, one cameraman, one man standing there with the permanent parcel number, and they took a photo of the front of the house. Every house. And this is where? At the Cuyahoga County Archives. Franklin Avenue? Mm -hmm. Franklin Avenue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as, as far as the garage doors getting in place, I understand when you know, people don't have to get new garage doors, maybe some garage door companies should be convinced that they need to make something yeah. that fits in the older style. <laughs> There just seems to be one replacement that you see. It's, it's that standard multi-panel. Uh, oh, is there anything else available? I, I don't know, but what we've had, you know, and I've seen these, and it, you know, the, the front door is always exposed in these homes in Forest Hill, the garage is in the front. It's really important to have a nice right. door. And there were so many nice doors. And for whatever reason, I don't know if they want to, you know, the, if they need to be painted, I guess, or they're, they're, they're maybe not as energy efficient. They leave them get rid of them for whatever reason. They're gone. It's, it's hard for them. They probably want to try automatic door openers, don't they? Yeah. What's that? Automatic door openers. Well, I mean, you can still have it. There's, 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 yeah, no, but, but you can still have that old garage door and have an automatic door open. That's not the reason. It's just for whatever reason they feel as though they need to buy a new door. You're in these nice doors. Maybe your organization should do a, a program on that or, or find what's out there, take pictures of them, you know, and, and start, uh, you know, some type of cause to save these doors. And there's also a lot of unique front doors that, 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 that are now lost. You see these beautiful homes, and all of a sudden they go to Home Depot and they buy the, you know, these oval doors that look terrible. But they look, they look, they look, they look mm -hmm. 
It's a, it's a lot about, it's just education. We have to get the word out there and whether it's yourself or your neighbor, I mean, we certainly try to do it through the Heritage Home Program as we work with all the right. homeowners we in, in, encounter, but sometimes the power of that salesman is... It's incredible. I mean, you're, you're inundated all day long with windows, siding, and roofing. That's apparently the answer to everything. Mm -hmm. And you've shown some pictures of homes here that were, you know, remodeled. I can take you on a trail of, of tears and just show you, you know, just <laughs> architectural sabotage of some of these homes in, in four still. It's amazing what, what, what has happened. It's, 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 it's sad. Mm -hmm. It's yes, Mark. As you mentioned before, well, that you know, for uh, Cleveland Heightsers, Heightsians, uh, whatever we are, um, Forest Hill is, you know, it's clearly a, a, a great example of mid-century modern. Mm -hmm. um, not really knowing, I mean, this is not the period that I know the best, but I'm curious in Greater Cleveland, um, how unique is Forest Hill? And maybe this is a question for anyone. Uh, are there other great concentrations um, of the quality that you see in um, the northern part of Cleveland Heights and any other part of Greater Cleveland? And if so, where? Um, I just like to go visit. To, sure. I am thinking there are certainly other different types of planned developments um, during this period. I think Forest Hills is unique as because it really calls to that contemporary, you know ranch style home but I immediately I can think of over on the west side of Cleveland when the um, car factories were really hustling and bustling 40s 50s and 60s they started their own planned communities for the workers much like Goodyear Heights did you know down in Akron not to this caliber of Forest Hills housing but you saw the minimal traditionals you saw the Cape Cods so it's not uncommon it's just a different style so I think you, a, a, a survey of that might be beneficial. Yes? Yeah, Forest Hills has actually got a number of different styles of houses. Yes, you know, you're right. A lot of the, the ranch stuff, but there are houses that were built back in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. and, uh, French Shore, style. Right, yeah. Uh, some of the steel cased houses Farther north, yeah. there are still frame houses. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I have a question about the, uh, about, I live in Forest Hills. <laughs> background on it. Uh, the roofs all leak, it seems. Okay. And uh, you know, you've got contractors on it as well. It's insulation. And, you know, all these solutions are, are offered up to uh, deal with uh, leaky roofs you know, from heating cables or ice dams. I mean, that's, ice that's dams, true. okay. Um, what uh, is the Cleveland Restoration Society's experience with how to deal with those kinds of issues. Uh, is it better uh, insulation? Is it heating uh, cables? Is it one? Well, shrink and it depends. Shrink, <laughs> shrink wrap. Yeah. It depends on the style of the house. Um, what does your soffit look like? What is your attic type? Is it finished? Is it not finished? You know, certainly insulation is a great way to go, but you can't just stop at insulation. You have to take it and make sure you do the ventilation. So they go hand in hand. You insulate, you have to ventilate, you have to keep that air moving. So when you're in your soffit, you wanna make sure that there's a baffle installed to the actual soffit vent so that air can travel on the back side of the insulation up to the roof line through the ridge vent to keep that area cold, to keep that roof line cold. The same temperature, so that ice, so an ice dam is when snow falls, it freezes, and then your heat escapes and melts it, or the sun hits it and melts it, and then it freezes again. And it's inevitable. We live in Northeast Ohio. We have cold winters. We have snow. Like, there's really nothing you can do to stop the ice dams. You can try to minimize them with insulation and ventilation and heat cables, um, but that's really the extent you can do unless you find a way to talk to Mother Nature. Let me know. Yeah, I, I know originally uh, Forest Hills uh, deed restrictions said you had to have a slate roof. Mm -hmm. so there were actually three choices, choices of roofs, yeah. slate, tile, and wood shape That's or in, in the beginning. And then a lot of people then asked all the shingle over stuff. So that's what I wanted to hear, the right. maybe mm -hmm. part of that. I had a couple more comments uh, since we have a Forest Hills wing here. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Forest Hills, moved into our house in 57, uh, just had to sell it mom had to move out. Mm -hmm. So it's been a kind of emotional year. Mm -hmm. But uh, did, fell in love with the house again. 
spending all summer there, fixing it and cleaning it and taking things out. And um, I just, and I'm also a realtor, so I ended up nervous. So, but um, I just wanted to share with you, well, first of all, the buyer walked, saw it in the garage door, had the two lines this way, two lines this way, over on the left, mm -hmm. and he said, X marks the spot. He knew that was his house. <laughs> and he loved it. So it's kind of a fun when you're talking garage doors. But I just, the, the short paragraph, because it kind of sums up what I think everyone was talking about. Um, okay, describing this branch. Uh, sought after mid-century brick branch with wonderful design elements located in historic forest hills. Absolute moving condition, open floor plan, huge family room, two fireplaces, AC, laundry, off, eat-in kitchen, updated electrical, newer roof and gutters, new carpeting, freshly painted throughout, summer 2015. One owner, incredible location, two and a half miles from University Circle, one mile to Kane Park, two blocks from the historic Heights Rockefeller building with restaurants, coffee house, and retail offices, two blocks from the Heights Community Center with the state of art, the arts, ice, spring, et cetera, et cetera. Immediate occupancy and violation. And sold in three days. But hopefully you can go back and visit. Some of the design elements and, and the mm -hmm. woodwork mm -hmm. and uh, the fireplaces, mm -hmm. the, um, you know, I, I fell out of favor with them as I got mm -hmm. older and moved away. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, wow, this is really cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's coming back. It's it definitely. definitely. Back. Uh, can I just say something about roofs very quickly? Sure. Um, again, Forest Hill. Um, we've had a problem with people moving into homes. And you know they, they find that there's a small leak in the roof. And somebody comes to them and says, Oh well, you have a terrible problem here, and you've got to take this off and put on. You've got to tear this off and put on asphalt shingle. Mm -hmm. And um, as I'm also a representative of Forest Health, so um, please let us know if you, you know, if you're in that situation or you know somebody who is, because we have uh, people that can help you fix the roof, so you don't have to tear off a slate roof, which is beautiful. It's fixable. Um, Almost always, not, I mean, sometimes it is. Sometimes it's been let go so long that there really isn't anything you can do. But then still at that point, there are, there's an attractive way to put asphalt shingle on that's, that, you know, that's, mm, would keep up the value of the house and so on and so on. So yeah, uh, concerned about roof care offs, concerned about window replacements, and concerned about very cheap siding with people going through the neighborhood, knocking on doors, saying, you have a problem and we can put this new roof on or we can put this siding on and it'll only cost you X. And of course, you know, then a year later, you're gonna have all kinds of problems. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just a oh, great right value for the home resource center. Right. You know, they do maintain books. So oh, yes. if you have a bad experience, go in there and tell them. Who we know we advertise them and we advertise. Um, the the yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Uh, the interior work. Uh, and I've got the Art Deco bathroom with the color tiles and everything, which I am, I am dead set on keeping. <laughs> what it takes. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have? a list of preferred or resources that are experts in working with those kind of tiles and restoring or modernizing the bathroom where you can keep the same motif, but you can make repairs to like a leaky shower mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. that you need to do and, and be able to replace or add on to some of those original materials in the same state. Yes, I mean, we have a database of contractors that we maintain um, through the Heritage Home Program and CRS. I'd be happy, every homeowner situation is unique and we try to gauge that and try to pair them up with the most appropriate contractor. So I'd be happy to share the names that I think would help your situation, at least for, to get, start talking with them. Anything else? Yes, I have a question. Okay. In the homes that were built that have the cords to take the windows up and down. Mm -hmm. We don't do that anymore. So what alternative is there to just simple replacement windows? You can repair your window. With those cords? Mm -hmm. Is there experts that can do it? Absolutely. Lots of them in Cleveland Heights. <laughs> Give me a call. Make sure you take my card. And it's 
far more inexpensive to do those repairs than to replace with the cheap vinyl window. That the, you've got the issues uh, the replacement windows do have those wonderful triple panes that the others don't. So how do you deal with the insulation on these older windows? Let me ask you, what is your wall insulation like? What is your wall insulation, insulation and your attic insulation? Okay, because a, a common common complaint is my windows are leaky, but you have to take into consideration the percentage of your glass panes to the expanse of the wall. So if you haven't taken the measures to insulate your walls or properly insulate your roof, changing out that small percentage of a window is not going to increase your energy efficiency. There's other air leak issues, and so we always suggest to homeowners to start with energy audits, which the Dominion. Um, and Good Sense have a partnership and they offer $50 uh, energy audits, which is a steal, <laughs> and then you can get rebates on the back end should you move forward with the improvements. <laughs> You're being summoned. <laughs> You're out of here. <laughs> Don't make trouble. You know too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Cleveland Restoration Society has a wonderful uh, collaboration with the city of Cleveland Heights and you can call them and they will come and look at your home and do a walk with you and a consultation even if you don't, don't go through the home, mm -hmm. home program, they'll come through and so you know if you have a leaky basement or you have some other issue, they'll come and walk through with you and give you some advice and guidance and also perhaps give you some ideas on contractors that you can work with. It's a free service to anyone in Cleveland. Thanks, Maisie. And if you might not need it, but you have your neighbor in Forest Hills or whoever, share the name. Say, hey, why don't you give them a call and see what's going on, too? Yes? Do you have anything in your uh, resource base that has to do with um, getting airflow through third floor attic spaces without using air conditioning? Um, finished or unfinished? Finished. Windows? <laughs> You have windows? Yeah. Um, Say if they're Yeah, windows, right. Right, sure. Um, let's chat after. And I can learn more, and then let's connect, and I can send some people your way. Or even um, just a conversation with our preservation construction manager might do it. Mary, yes. Can you put your phone number back up? Sure. There you go. Yes, Jane. Um, it sounds like just about everybody here is from Quinton Heights. <laughs> it seems that way. <laughs> um, okay, um, education is really important, mm -hmm. super important. Um, but for those of you who are concerned about your neighborhoods and things like doors and windows being replaced, um, Cleveland Heights could really use a landmark ordinance with D. And we're getting some new people from city council to the next election. And um, it would be a good opportunity to start pushing for that. And I agree. preserve that story. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's only so much right now that the city can do because there are no uh, strong local ordinances. So, like, as someone from the historical society, but really just speaking as an individual person who's interested in preservation, local ordinances are the way to go in order to help preserve our garage doors and our windows and things like that that really make our neighbors unique. Um, but you need to have council members who are particularly interested in that um, and can overcome some of the common fears that people have. Anything else? Comments, questions, or concerns? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry Dale. Um, requires homeowners to get permission from the standards committee before they make a change in their route. But it used to be Cleveland Heights required a permit for any kind of change in the route, and then they dropped that permit. So they don't re now they no longer require a permit or anything from the city for people to change their route. I wish they would go back to Cleveland Heights. I wish, yeah, they, they do not. They don't. 
to change your roof, Sabina Kohler. We have somebody from City Hall here. <laughs> what, what, what kind of change are you talking about? Like a tear off? For example. You do not have to get a permit? You do not have to get a permit in Cleveland Heights. They changed it a few years ago. They changed it. They were too poor to continue to have inspectors. So anything you could do to get that put back in place, I appreciate it. I think Jane had the, the best solution. Now is the time to talk to your council persons as they're new to the system or maybe newer to the system. Um, and it, that's really where it starts with your council people.